the bitter. Very bitter. In the meantime, while the, the Jerichonians or the Jerichites are there talking about uh, uh, what kind of God is this? And, and, and so the, the people over there say like, I mean, they, we, we remember in Egypt we eat out of the flesh pot and we ate to about to the food. Why, why don't we just go back to Egypt? Uh, why don't we just make a captain and go back to Egypt? What, what, I mean, it was better in Egypt. You see what I'm saying to you? So where's their faith? Where's their faith? And this woman who was a prostitute, she put her life in danger to save these men of God that they should be uh, they should be redeemed. That when their salvation come to pass, she also will inherit with them. Can you imagine that? So, it seems to me then, and you know, it's very important for us to recognize that even though her life was contrary, right, and the things that she was doing, but the Spirit of God was still working with her. And when the right time came, okay, you see that fruit came out of her because she made a covenant with them and said, listen to me. I'm begging you, don't let me die with, it, with these people. Okay, I know, I know, we, it's an animal, I know, we all know already that this thing is a done kiss. A done kiss with your God. It's done. And that's the reason why our place is shut up like this, that not even, I mean, maybe just even ants can pass through the, pass through the place or, or we shut it up tight. Because we are scared. And people that were scared of hell, they were scared, right? And the best thing we can do is lock the gate, lock the wall, lock everlasting, put swords on the wall. But even then we know that your God, I mean the things that your God is doing, there is no way if we have a million gods can we can get delivered from, from your God. What kind of faith is that? Right? And where is this coming from? From the person who is unsaved. The person who is a prostitute. The person who is outside of God and Christ as they usually use the same. And while in, in, in the person who is, who is supposed to be with God and Christ is still complaining and saying, uh, you know, I, I was better off when I used to be in the world. And I was better off when I used to, you know, I mean, I, I would rather Go back to Egypt. I would rather be doing this than we were doing that. And for all of you said before, I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. I'd rather have Jesus than riches and toll. You sang that song when you were baptized. You sang that song when you were saved. But later on now, you said, I'd rather. Right? Why you are saying I'd rather go back to Egypt? There is somebody who is outside of God and, and Christ, as you're saying, who is saying, I would rather leave this world and come to the place where you are. I'd rather leave that and come to Mount Zion. Amen? You better believe it. Still happens today. It still happens today. It said when we heard what your God did, we just collapsed. We, I mean, oh, it blew our minds. I'm, I mean, my God, I'm saying, he said, how? How could that something like that be? Hey, what kind of God is this? So sometimes when you make your testimony and the things you are saying, you're talking about the things that God done in your life, Somebody's looking at it and saying, wow, you know, you are the same one who, by the time another little challenge comes up, I mean, you are way down the bottom again, lying down like a cow sitting down, um, chewing its cud, 
right? Need somebody to poke you up to get you up back so you can, um, you know, get some buoyancy to yourself. And the Lord dealt with this kind of thing. If you are a children of God, we are children of God waiting for the coming of the Lord. We need faith. We need faith. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take you to another case. I don't know if I could just find it for a moment here. But it happened in the days of, 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 um, of, of Samuel, right? When he was a, when he was a, a child, right? And the scripture said here, uh, let me just read this also. The scripture said that it was the days of Eli, right? And Eli was a priest, a priest of God, high priest, but he wasn't following after God. He had got, his heart had gotten callous. God sent a prophet to warn him. It didn't move him. He sent a, a, an old, I'm going to say a grown man who was a prophet to warn him. It didn't move him. So God chose a little child, like a baby, out of the mouth of babies and sucklings, yard in strength, and, and told the baby, baby Samuel, little one, to warn him again. He said, I'm going to do one thing in, in Israel. Like when people hear it, they were going to be like, both of the ears a tingle. Right? It didn't change him either. So here comes the judgment now with his two sons. The Bible said they knew not God. Right? Those were the kind of men the same as today. The Bible said they were in, in uh, adultery and fornication with women, doing um, corruptible things, loving money, running after all these things, those things that we were doing. The same thing happening today. Right? And God said, he said, the Bible said, the Lord would slay them. The Lord, they, they, they think they're, they're in control them. But God, the same God that we have, <coughs> fear, she, <coughs> excuse me, Rahab feared the God of Israel. But the Israelites didn't fear their own God. Excuse me. So, here it is. The Philistines came up against Israel. And the battle was joined, excuse me. <coughs> when the battle was joined, the Bible said the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. That's 1 Samuel 4, verse 2. And when they joined the battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines. My God, what a disgrace! And they slew out the army in the field about 4,000 men. Israel was smitten by their enemies. Okay? But listen to this stuff. This is why I'm reading the story now. When the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore, hath the Lord smitten us um, today? before the Philistines. So they were saying, why did the Lord embarrass us this kind of way before our enemies? How, why, why, why would the Lord embarrass us like this? I mean, yeah, God is teaching you a lesson. He said to you, you're not listening to me, so now you're supposed to learn something from this because you see that you're not, you're not prospering because this, this embarrassment you're getting through it. Okay, this is what you, I'm, I'm giving you, I'm, chast, I'm chastising you. But they said, we can find a way around God's justice, man. Because we're smarter than God. So they said, let us bring fit the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us. That when it cometh among us, it, the Ark, you know, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. Okay, so you're going to, Put your investment in it. Right? So how is it going to save you? Are you an idolater? I mean, God 
It's teaching you a lesson. You're trying to circumvent God. It's trying to circumvent Him. Okay? By taking something which is a token of, you know, a token of His presence, but it's not Him. You can't circumvent God by taking up something. It's a well, I'm, I'm going to get around. I, I, I have a way of getting around. Right? So God said, oh, really? Okay, now. So then I'm getting the picture. The Bible said, so the people went and brought the ark. All right. And the Bible said, when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth rang again. And it started, whoa, 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 whoa. And the Bible said, the earth, like it's echo. So the Philistines over the other side were saying to themselves, Something that adding up here, it's not making sense. We just trounced them in, in the war, in the battle, and they celebrating. Something must have gone wrong. What are they celebrating about? The Bible said they found out that the ark of God was coming to the camp. And hear what the Philistines said. The Bible said. Uh, when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, verse 6, the reading from 1 Samuel chapter 4. They said, what means this noise of a great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was coming to the camp. And the Philistines were afraid. But he said, I said, Lord have mercy. The ark of the God of Israel coming to the camp? What? They said, hear what they said. They said, um, and they said, woe unto us. For there has not been such a thing here before. Woe unto us. Who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Be strong and quit yourselves like men. O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews. For... They have been as they have been to us. Quit yourselves like men and fight. And the Philistines fought. And Israel was smitten again. Smitten again. Trying to circumvent God. Trying to circumvent God. What I would say here. This is the days of Samuel. The Philistines heard about the plagues that God brought upon Egypt in the days of Moses. Right? Just like I talked about hey, Rahab, she heard, they heard these things. Right? The fame, the power of Almighty God had swept the earth. It was not just something that was localized to the his Hebrews. Right? It had gone over, all over the place. And Philistines, I mean Jerichoites, I mean whoever they are, ice. All of these people were terrified when they heard about the almighty power of the God of Israel. And God was having, oh Lord of mercy, God was just as were like fighting with these people all the day long, I'm telling like fighting with them. He said sometimes he said to Moses, how long should I bear these people? Then Moses sometimes was frustrated and he said to God, why do you make me with these people? I mean, I can't bear them anymore. I can't deal with this thing anymore, Lord, have mercy. Please, Lord, take me out of this earth or something. I mean, I can't deal with it. And God is saying the same thing back to him too. He said, hold on, I got to deal with these people. Right? What else do I need to do for them to understand? What else do I need to do? What else can I do for them? Right? What else do I need to do? Then the water was bitter. I told them to throw a stick in the water and it became sweet. They had no food. I told you, I brought manna for them. Eventually, they started to complain. I gave them the food that angels eat. I'm taking them, I mean, into eternity as it were. I'm taking them way ahead. I brought them as it were into heaven. They complain. And all they're looking about is um, telling me that they get to the point where they said, we we're better off in Egypt. We ate food by the full. Uh, I mean, did I ask you? You are the one who begged me. 
say you wanted to get out of Egypt. You said, you, and, and, I, and when you're talking, I never listened to you at first. I said, well, I didn't move. And you keep crying and crying and crying. And I said, okay, I'm going to take you up. I said, Moses, and you came out. And you were glad to get out. Then you get out, you start to complain from the time of the Red Sea. Talk about whether there are graves in Egypt. You don't know how those things, are back, I mean, I mean, just rile up inside of me. How, how dare you say something like that? Right? How dare you? Right? Right? He Hebrews, how dare you say something like that? Okay? And after God has taken you from one side to the next side of Egypt, I mean, out of the Red Sea, safely on dry land, you saw your enemies, their corpses were washed up on the side, and the fear on all his army, their corpses were there. Maybe you even have to bury them. I'm saying to myself, as I said to you, what else does Jesus need to do for you, for you to understand? Eh? By the following day, oh, I'm complaining again. Um, I, I collapse again. I, I just drop down to the... To the you know what I'm saying? What, what else is God supposed to do? What else is he supposed to do? Amen? And I'm saying the, the, the bitter irony of this whole thing is that outside of all of this, there is a person who is not saved, who you would say is out of God and Christ, and he knows nothing about, I mean, oh, come on, I wouldn't even go near those people. Our, our Bible said don't, don't sit in the seat of the scornful, and, and I wouldn't even want to be around those kind of people, right? But that kind of person is almost like envying you. Like Rahab and said, Lord, I just wish, you know, he remember one day she, she just hearing all these stories and it's stirring up inside of her. And she got her first opportunity to associate herself with these men who are men of the great God of all the earth. And she seized the opportunity. She grabbed it. And she said, you're not going to leave me out tonight. I know God is going to save you. And I know where you're going. I know you're going to a place. To the heavenly Jerusalem. Amen. I know where you're going. And I want to go there too. You're not leaving me. Okay. Make a covenant with me right here. Okay. I put my life on the line for it. I will give this life. So that I can get that life. With you. Yes. That's what she was saying. You know, and um, um <laughs> the, the the scriptures the scripture said here the scripture said it the um when I talk about oh you have a little faith, right? Je Jesus was was on the sea of um Jesus was on the sea of um, walking, and when Peter saw Jesus walking on the sea, Peter, something inside of him told him that he could do the same thing too, right? And he asked the Lord, where did I put the scripture though, man? I think it's, was it chapter 10? Um, I got it. Hold on one second here, hold on one second. I must find the scripture here. Because he was, he had just fed the, the 5,000, oh my Lord, okay, it's chapter 14, I don't even know, I just tell you sometimes that it's a lie, I don't know why, it's sometimes I just can't, let me just do the same Bible right now, since I found it. So Jesus is walking on the water, as I said before, Jesus sent his disciples across the sea. After he had fed these, this almost thousand people, maybe 15, 20,000 people, he sent them across the sea in a boat. I don't think they thought to themselves at the moment, like, but if we go across in this ship, he's supposed to join us. How is he going to join us? Is he going? Is there another boat? I guess they just went. Okay. 
And the devil said, hey, ha, 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 I know I got him. <laughs> uh, their confidence is left on the other side. Their hope is left on the other side. Their strength is left on the other side. Their joy is left on the other side. Their courage is left on the other side. Okay? Everything was left behind. And now they have nothing. They are alone. They are naked. I can just tear them up right now. And so the Bible tells you that um, the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, while the wind was contrary. Right? That's, right? That's verse 20, 24. Right? The Bible said the wind was contrary. In other words, I said like, and you know there are things that sometimes happen in your life. The Bible said that this is the, this is the, the devil is uh, working this thing, I mean, because the Bible said it was contrary. In other words, these men and men who understand shipping and all, I mean, as mariners, as sailors, they understand what they said. No, something is wrong here. What's going on here? You know what I'm saying? The devil was saying, hey, all that strength you had and all your courage and all the way is, is, is gone. It's, it's left behind. So let me see. I'm going to push you. I'm going to hit you as hard as I can. Right? And I'm going to give it to you. Okay? And I never said to add himself to injury now. While they are there now, scared because of the storm that took them on the sea, they want to appear now with a, a ghost. They see like a ghost coming. And they say, Lord of mercy, what are we going to do now? If only the Lord Jesus was with us. Excuse me. But, remember, excuse me, he was the one who sent you. So anytime he sends you to do something, he's always with you. Okay? Once you're going according to his commandment, once you're going according to his direction, he's always with you. Because he's the one who sent you. So in the midst of that now they think, okay, we're going to die now. I mean, this is it now. And they start to get worried now, I mean, out of this world, their minds are gone now, their head is... And so the Lord realized that they were scared. I said, the scripture said, And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. He said, Lord, but said, no, it's a spirit. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Their hope now was if Jesus were with them, then that wouldn't happen. He would take care of it. But the point of the matter is this, they were not walking in faith. Because if they're walking in faith, they're supposed to know that once the Lord sends you out and gives you something to do, He's with you. Okay? Okay, but they were just going by sight. You know, Jesus is here. We're okay. Jesus is not here. We're in trouble. But the Bible said, But straightway Jesus cried and spake unto them, saying, be not, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. He said, don't, worry, don't get scared, it's me. And they heard his voice. And they said, oh, okay. And he brought them comfort. He saw that they were terrified. And he brought them comfort. But he's teaching them a lesson. You understand? Because they cannot live that kind of way. Knowing that soon he would go back to heaven. And they can't continue to live that way where they always think that they had to see his physical presence to understand his, in, his omnipresence, right? His infinite presence. And the scripture said that when Peter answered him, saying, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. Right? So Peter was excited. He said, Lord, it's you for real? Ah, uh it's -uh. <laughs> So let me try to stay too. Let me come out of water to you. If you tell me, then it will be done. Okay? And Jesus said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. 
So he started to walk on the water. And I can imagine the rest of the disciples are looking like in awe, like, wow, Peter walking in the water too, like, oh Lord, Master. And, and, and I was like, you know, inside of them and the devil said, no, mm -mm, no, no, it shall not be, no, 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 no. I mean, I can't stop the Lord from walking in the water, but no ordinary man is supposed to be walking in the water too. And he, he said, I want to slap him with some waves and terrify him. And all this terror he had going to come, I'm going to hit him back with it. And the scripture said, but when he saw the waves boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus said, I'm not going to make the devil destroy you. Okay? He stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? In other words, Jesus was saying to him, you are doing fine. Eh? You are doing fine. But your, your faith, your faith is what killed the whole thing. Your faith is what killed the whole thing. Right? You had enough faith that took you, I don't know how many steps he made on the water. Let's say for example, he made 10 steps. Right? He could have walked all the way right up to where Jesus was and then turn around and come back with Jesus to the ship. But his faith was so was little. So it just took him a certain way. The devil cut him off. Oh thou of little faith, oh ye of little faith. Wherefore didst thou doubt? Jesus I said to him, You are doing well. But because of your faith. You're paying attention to these winds that the devil, the things that the devil are showing you, instead of paying attention to me. They can't help you. They're there to distract you. They're there to destroy you. They want to bring you down to hell. That's what they're there for. What the devil set them up for. I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Pay attention to me. I can't come that you would have life and eternal life. That is abundant life. Okay? And I have abundance of things. You are here a gospel today that's telling you about abundance of things and tell you that is abundant life. And and because you love you you don't want to pay attention to God, you believe it. Right? Do, do you have abundant life by the amount of food inside of your fridge? I don't want the food in your cupboard. Right? So how can a, a life be measured with things? Right? Pay attention to that. Right? And no matter how much food you have um, on a table and a man is, is standing there or maybe sitting there and he has a heart attack and he collapses, um, can you take up how much food and, and give him an and pile food in that poor food in the mouth or whatever I think and try to make him live. You'd rather him kill him more quickly. Right? So things don't. Can you put out more clothes on him? Can you put gold and silver on his hands and all these things and make him live? Life is precious. Only God gives life. He takes away. It has nothing to do with the amount of things you have. That's not life. Okay? And Jesus said there in Luke 12, he said, Take heed! A beer of covetousness, for a man's life consists of not in the abundance of things which he possess. Okay? Luke chapter 12. Because a man was asking him, I said, Lord, uh, feed my brother, let me divide the land with me. And the Lord tell him, he's taking a beer of covetousness. Right? Was thinking about estate and, and all these kind of things. He said, You, I'm warning you. Because don't think that this, this, if you get. Whether you get a piece of land or get more of the land or half of the land or a quarter of it, whatever, it's not going to bring you into eternal life. She said, be aware of it. Okay? It's quite a year with your brother. You know, I said, I'm, I'm not a judge. I'm not getting into it. But I'm warning you. I'm warning you about your soul. Okay? I'm not getting into your thing with your brother and this thing with the land or whatever. I'm not interested in not even important. Okay? So you have somebody who's telling you about that's what you need to do. And you run after me. That's how the children of Israel. And I'd run 